All right, I am here with James Benson. James, how are you tonight, sir? Doing pretty good, pretty good. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. So, please uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Tell me about yourself. Um, uh, my name is James Benson. Um, I'm from Seattle, Washington, uh, just kind of outside the area. But, uh, kind of grew up on both sides of the mountains. Uh, grew up in Issaquah, Washington. Went to college out in Washington State University, and uh, <clears throat> made my way out to uh, out to Japan here, and uh, loving every every minute of it. It's it's quite a journey, so it's a pleasure to be on. Well, yeah, yeah. Thank you for being on. Uh, so, how long have you been in Japan now? Um, I've been in Japan for about two and a half years. Started uh, English teaching when I first got here, so it's a uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. So you're you're still relatively new to Japan, then? Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 pretty new. the The language has definitely been a huge hurdle for me, um, but it's um, something that I try and try and study at and uh, get better at every every day. That's um, yeah, it's a daily daily work in progress. I can tell you that. Right, right. So you're actually the first the first person I've had on who who lives in Japan that it that is still fairly new to living here I, I've usually interviewed people who've been here much longer but uh, but you're you're quite new so um, first I, I just want to get a little bit about your background and um, how you came about how you came to uh, how do you say how you came to be interested in Japan in the first place, and what motivated you to finally make that decision to get over here? Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, I know that, uh, like after after college, I I graduated with a criminal justice degree, and um, I had a lot of in, intention to make use of it and and get involved uh, with something either in law enforcement or with juvenile rehabilitation and uh, I graduated college at at the wrong time <clears throat> graduated in 08 when oh, yeah. things things really took a dump and uh, a lot of a lot of money got pulled out of government uh, services and, and law enforcement and that kind of a thing um, went I, I held down quite a few jobs actually before I came out here but um, but the last I got involved with a security company, I uh, did that for about five years. And I kind of got to a point where I knew that I wasn't, um, it's like I wasn't making use of um, my talents, nor was I doing something that I felt grew me. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I could be extremely honest, and I could say that uh, I had some ideas that came to me in a uh, <laughs> in a psychedelic experience. Um, okay. And uh, truth be told, uh, yeah. But uh, but um, I'd also read a book by Rolf Potts called Vagabonding, yeah. which had a huge huge effect on me, and um, and it actually spoke to me kind of on a level that was uh, pretty, um, you know, when you get a certain party that kind of wakes up when you hear something that's true and you know that uh, as much as, you know, you can kind of lie to yourself and kind of be like, oh, everything's cool and, you know, I'm going to kind of follow the program that's been handed to me, you kind of get the idea that like, oh, I should just go ahead and drop all this and make go of it on my own and take risks for my own my own, uh, you know, for my own well-being, my own future. So, so I uh, got that little nugget growing inside my uh, my brain, and uh, quit my job, and went and got a Tesla certificate, and had a buddy of mine that um, was saying that, hey, you know, a great way to make money I should also explain for those who's listen for those people who aren't you know familiar with that book uh, vagabonding 
it's kind of uh, a book that's about uh, discovering a richness in life that has to do with uh, casting things like material goods and um, wealth acquisition, that kind of stuff to the side. And it's more about um, finding uh, growth in connecting with humanity and uh, through travel, in, 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 to be specific. And uh, so, yeah, so I, I quit my job, got this Tesla certificate. A buddy of mine knew I was kind of on this path, and he'd worked for a company called uh, Earnest Expert Service. And a uh, great company, uh, by the way. Um, and <clears throat> kind of put me in touch with somebody, and, and they said, you know, hey, we don't have anything going on at the moment, but, um, you know, let's keep in touch. And I looked around all over the world. And Ernest Expert Service, by the way, was specifically for Japan, Tochigi. And uh, so I um, went and um, talked to him a few times uh, in between, kind of keep in touch. And they, uh, they ended up getting back to me and saying that they had somebody that was leaving. It was an Australian guy. They said he was leaving. And... Uh, could you be here in two weeks? And I was like, oh, oh, okay. That that's kind of a a quick, you know, a quick oh. thing. Hey, can you can you drop everything and just move over here in two weeks? You know. Oh, totally. Yeah. So, you know, um, so I said, yeah, let me get back to you. Um, I said, I said, I'm I am definitely interested. Let me um, just talk it over with some of my 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 loved ones and that kind of thing. And. Uh, I just need to make sure that I'm good for it. Uh, let me get back to you. And so I, <clears throat> I, you know, did some real quick math and figured out, okay, this is this is going to be an awesome, uh, an awesome opportunity. Like I said, I was I was working in security, and I'd gotten to where I was, you know, like a, uh, like a supervisor in a security company, and I knew that every Every day and out was kind of, you know, A, it was the same thing, but also B, I, I just kind of wasn't doing something that I felt like I was, um, I wasn't building anything. I wasn't building anything for me or for anyone I cared about. So, right. you know, so I was like, I think I'm going to do this. And I talked it over with my mom and, and, uh, and my dad and my brother and, and they all kind of gave me the same advice. They were like, if you think you can do this, go ahead and you know go for it. And I said, "All right, cool." And bit the bullet. Called him back. Um, they said, "Cool." Um, you know, uh, get your plane ticket kind of squared away, and and uh, you know when you get here, we'll we'll go from there. And I packed up all my earthly belongings into two suitcases I bought from Costco, and mm -hmm. I, I made a leap of faith. And jumped into the darkness and and uh, took a chance and yeah that's yeah. Uh, that was that was a real real thing too looking back on it man that's uh that's a big jump it is man it is i yeah. I did the uh, the same thing I mean you know similar circumstances not exactly the same but i I would say that um, making that decision just to drop everything and just pack your bags and move you know it's 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 a heavy decision you know but it's yeah totally I have no regrets about it how about you no no regrets um, I know at the time uh, too I did find myself kind of in a weird spot where like you know I just come out of like a uh, I was in a you know pretty decent long long term relationship that had like kind of come to a come to a finish and you get that weird thing where you're like, okay, I just had a bunch of things just clear off the table. Yeah. And and then I had a job that I wasn't too like, you know, addicted to nor really totally concerned with. And so I was like, God, you know, if there's a if there's a time to do it, it's probably gonna be now. So you know. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Huh. Well, um that I mean, that's that's cool. So you had you ever visited Japan before, or, or why did you choose Japan specifically? Uh, I had I had never visited Japan before. Um, I had uh, a few Japanese friends, um, like growing up, and I kind of had like a little bit of exposure to like Japanese 
uh, culture. You know, being in Seattle, we actually have a pretty decent um, Japanese American community. Right. And um, and so I had met a lot of people through college and just out with friends and stuff like that, Japanese folks. And and uh, so I kind of. You know, it sounds sounds weird, but for me personally, I think it's a really big deal. I always thought that like Japanese people were very polite mm. and they were very measured, and those are two qualities that when you, when you don't find that in somebody, uh, it's like a real pain in the ass for for me. Like, yeah, right. you know, I like being polite, and so when I meet people who are polite, um, it's it's a pretty attractive quality, and so. You know, um, that was one part of it. Uh, I know that Japan had always kind of had this kind of ancient quality to it as well. And I've always had kind of an addiction to ancient societies, uh, you know, like, you know, like the Chinese or like, I've always wanted to go to Israel, haven't been, uh, wanted to go to Egypt, that kind of thing. Um, I've been to, you know, like, been to Rome and in you know, just, you know, Italy at large, and then, you know, Greece, and I studied abroad in Turkey, and I've always kind of been addicted to, you know, kind of history, and so I knew that that was going to be like one little itch I could scratch, and to be honest, um, I never like had Japan as like a place I wanted to go and like settle or anything, but um, but I definitely wanted to see the world, and my buddy having the connection, you know, to to kind of plug me into, uh, I knew this would be an awesome place to, to, to get started. Right, right. So yeah. you've you've uh, you've bought your your plane ticket. You didn't have a visa at this point, is that correct? No, yeah, they they fast tracked my visa. Um, okay. Because they were kind of in a uh, Ernest was kind of in a tough spot uh, with this guy leaving on such short notice, and um, so they kind of gave me this this like little mini laundry list of a couple things I had to get together and mm -hmm. and then I had to uh, go down to the Japanese uh, embassy downtown Seattle and kind of submit it as this you know kind of packet and you know uh, they they paid for like an expedited uh, visa processing they got back to me like not even joking less than a week it was like mm. maybe five or six days yeah. and you know I, I'm not like you know I don't have some giant you know, criminal record or anything like that I'm, you know, so it's like I'm not you know I'm not like a, some somebody on somebody's radar so you know it's just like punch well, punch stamp well, stamp that's good you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah so getting the visa processed wasn't wasn't too difficult um, especially you know when you have a company also that uh, seems established, you know, not just somebody that you found off of like, not to knock Dave's ESL, but I've heard some people's stories go sideways trying to find jobs through through them, mm. Dave's ESL dot com. Um, but um, but it helps to to find a legit company to start with because it seems like they can pull a few strings in your favor. I ended up getting when I first showed up, I got a, a five year visa. Wow, and, are you yeah, serious? really unheard of yeah because yeah. it is as long as I've been here I've never had a five-year visa I've uh, the most I've had have been three-year visas so that was you got extremely extremely lucky with that that is a good yeah. deal right there so you're yeah. still on that visa right uh, no actually I had to no. switch which was which was I was so so bummed when I had to switch um, because like the original visa was a um, what do you call it? It's a like a it's not an instructor's visa, but it's like a humanities, uh, right? Humanities, yeah. It's a humanities visa that they hooked me up with, mm -hmm. and I think somebody knew somebody that knew somebody that knew something about, and they hooked they hooked it up, and and so I ended up with this five year visa. But when I did switch away from uh, Ernest, because the contract ended. And they didn't have anything for me. I switched over um, with my new employer and got um, got a one-year visa. And I was like, "No, like why?" So, 
<laughs> that that's that's intriguing because yeah. once you have a visa, that's valid until it expires. Right, you're, yeah. you you shouldn't be forced to switch your visa. Yeah, this this came at the recommendation of uh, one of the employers of mine. Hmm. One of the employers, um, like that, basically my boss was like, "Oh, you need to switch over your visa from from the humanities visa to a explicitly instructor visa." Okay, so, oh, what yeah. what kind of job did you switch to then? So right now I'm working for uh, the board of education okay. in. In, in my city, so okay. that now now that's that's the reason why. Um, yeah. yeah, because before it, you know, to those who aren't familiar, Ernest is like a private English um, school company, right? It's like a for-profit company, correct? Yeah, yeah, they're a, yeah. they're like a dispatch agency. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. So with that, you'll be under the humanities visa, but for if you're working for the board of education, you're working for the uh, the government, right? So you have to switch your visa for that, and that's why probably you had to you had to switch your visa. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, yeah, because if, for example, if you didn't get your job with the Board of Education, but you left your earnest job, you could have honestly wrote out that five-year visa, looking, you know, what what it, finding work, whatever you could that fit under that you know what I'm saying so yeah um, that's uh, you got lucky when you first came but yeah, yeah. a lot of people are regulated to a one year visa after that so yeah yeah totally so I did I did walk away from that but uh, but, but hey I, I got I got a I got a pretty good gig out of it working for the board of education so not not too different from my my first job when I first showed up yeah so, so well, how long were you at uh, Ernest just by chance, ah, uh, so um, I I showed up in Japan in August of 2016, mm -hmm. and I worked for them until March 2017. So it was only, you know, how many months is that? So I was like, you know, four, three, seven, 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 some some change. Um, I worked for uh, Ernest for for that long before that contract ran out. That was the other thing too was. Um, they were only putting me up for a short, you know, seven month contract and, yeah. uh, which was also like, that's a bit, that's a bit odd. Usually yeah, it, it's usually like, like minimum of six months. I've, I've seen six months contracts and I've seen year contracts. I've never seen a seven month contract. Uh, that's, that's such an odd number. Yeah, yeah. totally. Uh, yeah. How was your experience working with them? I mean, you know, I, I've I, I've only heard of of Ernest, uh, I've, and I've known people who work for him, but I I've, I don't have any experience with them. Um, it was great actually. Yeah. Um, they totally hooked me up when I when I first came into into town. I flew into Narita and in Tokyo, and um, you know, uh, I'll go ahead and say names. Yeah, Greg. Uh, Greg's the guy that um, I was talking to. Uh, Greg Halliday. He he. Came and met me at the airport, and um, you know, after I after I got out, um, we we hopped on the the train. It was like the Skyliner or whatever out of Narita to Ueno, and then took a Shinkansen, and that was kind of cool. I'd never been on you know like a Japanese bullet train. I had been in Europe, but Japanese bullet trains like uh, it was like no nonsense. I made it from from uh, Tokyo up into Tochigi in like like forty minutes. Yeah. Which is Yeah, it's about a forty five minute ride, right? Oh yeah, yeah, and it's it was it was so fast and I remember being kind of blown away by um, you know, because you get off the plane and you know, if you've ever experienced like culture shock or anything like that, I mean it was my first time in Japan and right. I had everything I own in two suitcases and I'm looking around and everything is in Klingon and I'm oh. like okay. <laughs> like <laughs> Like uh, you know, I just had this like yeah, because you you hadn't studied the language at, at all before you came over here, right? No, not a word. Um, I knew how to say like, you know, konnichiwa, and I knew how to say like arigato, and how to say like, you know, just yeah, the basic super, shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How to say like, you know, like sumimasen, like if I bump into somebody, 
or something like that. Or Gomen Asai. Like I, I knew You had that on me, man. When I came here, I, I didn't even know that. I just knew I, I knew less than that. So don't, yeah. don't feel too bad. Yeah. No, yeah, I I came here empty handed. Hmm. And uh but yeah, Ernest hooked me up, man. They they um yeah, they got me on a train, brought me into town. First thing we did was we went to uh we went to my apartment. Uh, it was like a little Leo palace that they had arranged for me. Went in. Uh, they had uh, gotten me a, like a futon and, and a, a, you know pillow blanket set up and everything. And, and uh, you know they they like helped me set up like my you know like the smart TV that they have. Mm-hmm. You gotta like log on and create a screen name and it has like internet and everything built in like. Yeah. The Leo palaces. So they're like getting you all figured out, and tracking uh, your every move. Yeah, yeah, and they, <laughs> they they got me all got me all squared away. Like, oh, does your you know laptop get on there? Okay, okay, cool. And then um, you know, and he's like, well, um, you know, you have you know like uh, it's like four days or whatever until your first day of work. So you know, have fun, walk around town. Um, they told me to pull out a certain amount of money before I came, so I had I had cash in my pocket. And uh, they said, you know, we'll, how mu- uh, j- sorry, um, how much cash did they recommend that you take? Uh, they recommended that I pull out what was equivalent to about like uh, two, two to three thousand dollars American. Okay. Um, so I, I pulled out about two grand. So I had two grand in my pocket. And yeah, that's um, that that's pretty good. Um, and the reason why is because you have to wait until like the following month to get the, the paycheck for the current month that you're working. Right? Exactly. And that's, that was something that I thought was like <clears throat> a, a bummer and then be a, a major pain in the ass. But they warned me beforehand, like you're going to need this money. So, um, you know, do you have it? That was one of the things that they asked me before I, before I was really signed on was like, do you have this money? And, and luckily I did cause, um, I was, pretty damn serious about this. I'd, I'd quit my job and I'd gotten this TESOL certificate and yeah. I'd saved up some money and I was, I was, I was pretty, pretty hardcore about it. And so I had the money. And, uh, so when I got to my place and they set me up and everything, I think the part where it really dawned on me that I was in Japan was after they set up the internet and everything, y'all cool. All right. Do you need to call anyone? Do you need anything else? And no, I'm good. And then they gave me like a map showing me where like the local grocery stores were and stuff. And then they said, wow. cool. all right, um, see you later. And then they walked out the door and I remember just the quiet of standing in my apartment in Japan and being like, oh, this is real. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, oh, I'm my, here. My, like, my, uh, my, my moment that I realized I was here yeah. is, so you're, you're from the West Coast, so you, you – yeah. the US so you're probably used to this but being from Texas mm-hmm. I had never experienced this before but the day that I arrived and I, I got to the um, the share house of where I was training for my job there was an earthquake and I never in my life felt an earthquake before and the day that I arrived in Japan there was an earthquake and I, I honestly it wasn't big it was just like a small little trimmer but I honestly had no clue what what the hell to do and it was at that moment that I knew okay I'm I'm somewhere different you know yeah, so. it's like this this is not Texas yeah yeah <laughs> yeah totally well that's yeah, cool I mean that, that that's really cool because you know everyone has that moment when they arrive where it, it really hits them you know and that that was yours you um, you were just oh, like yeah. see that's cool that they provided you all that information like I was just kind of thrown to the wolves, you know. I mean, they they helped me set up my um, my cell phone and and internet and all that stuff, but otherwise, it was just like you're on your own. Explore and just do what you need to do, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm actually uh, s- super thankful, and I uh, really do. What's funny is like, yeah, af- after the fact, I really appreciate from talking to other people. I really do appreciate that um, that company really did provide and look out for me when I first got there, and uh, yeah, they they did. They um, they hooked me up with the apartment. They got me squared away with with my bank account later on, like the next week. Yeah. And 
everything, walk me through it, because, you know, it, it is a pretty alien experience. Like when, you know... Especially you, if you don't know the language, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, especially. And so, you know, having having somebody go to bat for you is uh, it's pretty pretty awesome. So. Well, good, good. So what what made you decide to say I'm not going to renew with them and just go to the board of education or was it or what 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 led to that? Yeah, so like what happened was um they're a dispatch company. They're so And, and what is that for for people unfamiliar? So a dispatch company is maybe like a company that you know sometimes uh providing English teachers may not be the only thing they're doing. They, they might have uh, other other things that they do. They might be recruiting for other companies that need, you know, foreign folks, maybe like engineers or... Um, so the company's called Earnest Expert Services. And so they're, they're trying to source people who have something that a Japanese company is looking for. Yeah. And um, so one of the things that they, that they did was uh, for looking for ALTs because they can go talk to a board of education in a city and um, you know plug in you know uh, some 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 teacher that maybe already lives in Japan or maybe is just starting or coming from a different country that has credentials uh, or doesn't have credentials sometimes if they're in, if they're in need um, you know if you just have a bachelor's degree Sometimes that's you know that's that's just enough, and in Japan that tends to be a lot of the case. There's there's enough demand in Japan where you just need a bachelor's degree. But like um, so, my contract was coming to an end, and they let me know that every year they have to fight and bid for that contract with other dispatch companies. Mm-hmm. Um, so that contract with the Board of Education, you know, being renewed every year, it, it's not a guaranteed position. So they warned me about, you know, okay, well, when March comes, uh, you know, we won't be able to really tell you until it's pretty close to the the moment. And and so, like, I was kind of stressing out because I didn't know if I was going to be out of a job or not. Yeah, and, that's, a bit, that's a bit stressful, man. I mean, yeah, it was. You know, y- usually a, a lot of companies here will give you at least, you know, a four or five month notice or, you know, maybe six, you know. So yeah. that's that's uh, that's cutting it pretty damn close. Yeah, and I um, I uh, I was kind of I was coming up on it, and uh, one of the one of the big factors in my mind was not just that I was going to be out of a job because because I've I've been out of a job before, you know, and I've I've you know not really had like a you know, place to go sometimes and crashed on a few couches, but like um, couch surfing, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I, you know, I made it work, but um. But yeah, so I was kind of up against that. The thing that was really uh, on my mind was, um, you know, some guys would say I went and made the mistake, but like it totally wasn't a mistake. Uh, went and went and met me a went and met me a girl, and uh, so uh, I had a girlfriend at the time, a Japanese girlfriend, and and uh, so I was I was really worried that I wasn't going to be able to. I was like, oh, dude, am I getting? You know, it's like, am I getting handed my hat? I'm going to be leaving Japan. Do I have to like, you know, break up this, you know, relationship when I don't want to? When there's nothing wrong? Like, ah, oh, that was that was weighing heavy on me too. Right. Yeah. Um, when it came to the end of that, you know, in, in March, it was, it was like, um, you know, I, I went and looked around a little bit and happened to talk to a buddy of mine who worked for the Board of Education and said that they were expanding next year and uh, they're going to hire some new teachers um, said you should uh, shoot off a resume to um, to this this guy here handed me a piece of paper with his email on it and went ahead and did that and heard back real quick and he wanted me to come in for an interview and I talked to him and and uh, he said okay well it's it's, it's going to be you know this is what like your schedule would look like is that cool and I said yeah it's not too different from the last job cool and, you know, you'll be making this, cool, okay. Um, and then, are you currently under obligation obligation with any other employers? And I was like, no, not really. <laughs> and so I kind of had to, like, you know, be like, okay, 
I'm jumping ship. I'm going to go to this next company. And so I had to, you know, have one of those things where I called up Ernest and I'm like, you guys were the best and hooked me up and, you know, pretty much held my hand into Japan. Like, uh, you know, and you know, I'm really sorry, but I got to jump, which actually turned out not to be a bad decision because they lost the contract. And so they would have let me go last minute. Yeah, so, I mean, you got to look out for, for you, you know, uh, that's, that, from what you've said, Ernest seems like a really legit place, because the reputation, yeah, I'll just say tell you this, the reputation that a lot of dispatch companies have is not good, and so no. they seem, from what you've described, they seem to be one of the better uh, dispatch companies that operate in Japan, so um, kudos to Ernest, right? Um, yeah, totally. But, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, any yeah, any place that gets you on your feet and uh, get you started here, you know, you got to give them credit. Like for me, it was um, Eon. It was one of the big corporate uh, schools, which is one of the few that's still around. You know, um, a lot of them have have gone under, but Eon's still around. They helped me a lot with my stuff, so I got to give them credit for that. Uh, they they really took care of me when I first came here and uh, got me on the ground running so you know you, you, you can't uh, you know a lot of people have had negative very negative first experiences here and it seems like we've we've been very lucky in that respect yeah 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 so you you started working with the board of education so what where exactly do they have you working um, once you signed up for them so when I when I first started with uh, Board of Education, um, and when I first came, when I was working for Ernest, I was working at uh, a junior high school, and just a junior high school, so I had one school. And then when I came to the Board of Education, they were telling me, um, so we're going to be expanding our elementary school program, so um, do you, you know, do you have any problem with, like, working with, you know, real little kids, hmm. like, you know, five-year-old kids, and yeah. I was like, never done it before, uh, but I'm pretty good with kids, and, and so I was like, yeah, it's, I think it'll be fun, and uh, so they started me off at, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays with a junior high school, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I was working at uh, elementary school, and uh, and I got really, uh, got really into it, and at first, I thought, you know, I thought at first, like, oh, little kids, that sounds like a pain in the ass. Hmm. And, uh, but I also kind of thought it'd be fun, but it, uh, it actually turned out to be my favorite of, of all. Um, I love teaching little kids and, uh, they're, they're, they're little goofballs. They're hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I really enjoy it. Yeah. And, uh, I didn't think I would, you know, uh, like I said, I knew I was good with kids, but like, uh, I didn't think I'd like working with little kids as much as I did. They're, they're, like I said, absolutely hilarious. Whenever I come into one of those classes, you know, um, they're, they're just little cartoons and they'll just say things. And if your Japanese gets good enough to where you can figure out what they're saying, um, they will, they will entertain you. They're, they're the most hilarious little human beings. Yeah, I mean, they're actually a, a good way to uh, to learn pretty elementary Japanese, you know, okay. because yeah. um, if, if you're just starting out, you know, you're pretty much like a little kid with learning Japanese. So that what a what a perfect group to uh, to learn off of, you know? Oh, totally. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. it's hard because they'll, you know, they're little kids, they'll kind of like mumble talk or they'll kind of oh, yeah. say things that are kind of like baby talk Japanese and... Um, but, uh, but it is funny because they will use this very elementary Japanese. And so, you know, if, if you're a person who's come to Japan and you're teaching and you're trying to learn Japanese, um, you'll hear them say those first couple of verbs and nouns, real simple stuff. You know, you'll hear them say like, you know, body parts, hand, head, face, eye, ear, you'll yep. hear them say all that stuff. And, uh, and you can ask them basic questions and, uh they'll respond and get this little like yes like moment like I just had a miniature conversation with a yeah, yeah. little kid probably linguistically on the same page I am yeah, yeah. And, and kids 
and kids are just like uh, at least the the their minds are just like a sponge you know like they learn just so quickly uh-huh. so you see the progress in teaching them very yeah, it's, very fast that's, you know it's impressive uh i knew the kids learn language fast but i didn't realize how fast yeah like, they when you have like one hour with them like like on a Friday, you have like a, a one hour lesson with like a little class of five year old kids. And you'll have this one lesson where you're just, you're running through animals and you're like, lion, lion. And they say lion. And, oh, giraffe, giraffe. Okay. And then next week you'll hold up the card and they'll be like, giraffe, lion, flawless. And I'm just like, there's like 20 different animals here. But those kids, you know, just absorb it. They're, they're, Brains are primed for yeah. for language acquisition. Yeah, it, it resonates, you know. And yeah. now, there there is downsides to teaching elementary kids. Have you encountered any of these downsides? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it's not all rainbows, but you know. yeah, it's not all rainbows. Um, you know, occasionally you're gonna get punched in the dick or like uh, you're <laughs> that kind of stuff. The uh, I... the old concho up, up the ass, oh. right? Yeah, I had like read about that and thought it was kind of a funny joke until it happened. Um, yeah, it, uh, for people who don't know what a concho is, uh, make yourself like two finger guns with your hands, put them together, and then run up behind someone and jam that finger gun into someone's butt. And that's what a concho is. And they sneak up right behind you, and then they yell concho, and they'll drive that finger gun into your into your butt and it's uh it's no joke one of the most alarming feelings <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you were not prepared the very first time that happens you were not yeah, prepared for that are you not prepared no. yeah what was your response because you can't you can't let that become like a regular thing because that's just that's just not right you know <laughs> I mean, no. for, for for a Westerner's perspective, that's just like, what the hell are you trying to do, sticking your finger at my ass? You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my first reaction was pretty um, was to I just I flipped around and I was like, I was like, ooh no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't do that. You know. Yeah, don't you do that? Yeah. Like, I think I think like I probably gave them the same look that like like my dad would give me when I did something wrong where they flip around and just give you that eyeball that stares through your soul like mm. like oh no yeah so yeah. pretty sure that that's what happened because I saw them kind of recoil and I, I didn't know it's like I it's like I've in my old older age I've, I'm crossing into dad age now yeah yeah uh, I think I flipped around and gave the kid a real dad look <laughs> well yeah I mean like if you look at it from their perspective they're not really like doing it out of a place of malice that's just what they are learn from their friends that it's yeah. a funny thing to do you know but to show i mean what i've done to show them that look i'm not going to tolerate you doing that to me i just I, I don't get angry or anything i just give them a stern look and say no don't do that please you know and they kind yeah. of get the hint from that so yeah. yeah at least most do I mean there, there's some there's some asshole kids that do what they want to do but you know that's that's yeah. that's just that happens you know yeah and when, when when I do when I meet those kids the first thing goes through my head is like oh god help their parents like you know that, that kid's an extra special terror well I would say what I would say is the parents brought it upon themselves you know yeah, yeah. the kid learns it from somewhere so you two know, demons have a demon. What are you gonna do? Yeah, I mean, if if a kid is a piece of shit, you got to look at the parents, pretty much, yeah. or or the lack of parenting. You know, so, yeah. I mean, the the good thing about kids is they can always be kind of redeemed. So even if you have like a really terror terror kid, you know, there's a chance that they can be turned around with with the right um, dis discipline and I, and I don't mean that you know like smacking them across the face or anything I, I'm just saying like you know as we were talking about with the language ac- acquisition the kids kids minds are very malleable so like even learned actions from their parents 
you know, aren't always set completely in stone if they do some bad shit, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so, so far, you've been here, would you say, about two and a half years now or so? Yeah, yeah, yeah about two so, and a half. We, have you, uh, a lot of people who come to Japan, in fact, most people, have this sort of honeymoon phase. How long did that last for you? Ah, um, I think when I first came to Japan, the, uh, there was like, there was the bewilderment phase, Yeah. but it's also part of the honeymoon phase, like the, just the complete bewilderment. Um, oh, hi, I'm in Japan, hi, oh, look yeah. at that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and like, I didn't, like I didn't speak, I didn't speak any of the language, so like, yeah. Um, so I did a whole lot of supermarket shopping because you don't have to have a conversation. You don't walk in the door and they ask you how many and then you sit down and they ask you a million questions. So I was just eating out of the supermarket a lot. I was going to the, you know, the local Thai Raya and going in and getting, you know, kind of like pre-made meals and stuff like that yeah. at first until I could go get my pots and pans and, and then I could start cooking my own stuff. But, um, but yeah, the honeymoon phase, um, like, I think the honeymoon phase for me probably lasted about right, like nine nine months, maybe. Wow, really? Which, yeah, yeah, but that's, that's actually quite long for for that. The, I, I for I I'd say anyway. Yeah, yeah, and and I think I think I gave it every bit of my, you know, like just just thinking, you know, oh well. You know, I understand that certain things are difficult, but you know, just oh, look on the brighter side. You know, and you know, just kind of right. being chill about it. And so, you know, that's not to say there's, you know, that this isn't like worthwhile. You just will run into things over time that will chip away at you a little bit until you lose that honeymoon phase. And yeah. for me, I think I got away without a lot of those hurdles coming my way that came to other people. And so, for me, it lasted about nine months. Okay. Like, uh, now, now, when you finish that, mm -hmm. now that it's not always the case, but there's different levels to how people see themselves in Japan. There's there's that honeymoon phase, and that's usually followed by a kind of a crash where they kind of go through a sort of negative, like yeah, everything sort of like they either get homesick or like even like little things about the country sort of piss them off or you know like did you ever have any sort of like negative sort of dip in that feeling or, or no yes um yeah. very big um very big. okay well mine you know like i said the honeymoon phase went for quite a while mine wasn't necessarily negative on japan for anything that japan was doing it was uh for me it had to do with um, when I came to Japan, uh, I I didn't I hadn't really honed a skill set for for finding for finding friends. I didn't really have um, a process or a place. I hadn't really had no like community or any. I had no I had no kind of place to start. I just had like the people that I was working with, and then people that I kind of met through people that I worked with but I didn't have like a solid like friend base so I was I was doing a lot of like um, like getting off from work feeling uh, sometimes like a little bit stressed out just you know being in Japan and it being different and being pretty stressed out and I I remember coming back to my place and uh, you know, I'd go stop by like the Lost or the Seven Eleven, you know, and I'd and uh, pick up a few beers, and that's that's when you can that's when the lonely can really set in is when you get a few beers in you, and you're like, like I miss friends, <laughs> like I miss right. friends, right. and uh, so I do remember that for the first like four months I really didn't have like a solid set of friends, and it was toward the end of that four month period, kind of like right around November, December, right after I first came, uh, where I started noticing that just like my behavior was kind of taking a, uh, kind of a turn because I noticed that like I was, um, I was 
just kind of, I don't know, not, not angry, but I was getting frustrated when I shouldn't be. Right. And I was kind of antsy. Yeah. I get home and I didn't want to be by myself. So kind of an anecdote or an antidote to that was that I would, um, I would listen to a lot of podcasts and I used to go on, you know, walks along this river that was by my house. And, uh, that kind of helped me get over it. It was kind of felt social. I was listening to a conversation, yeah. um, you know, and that kind of helped me get over it. For me, it was a big social hurdle because okay. back in college, I was, I was uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty social guy and, uh, you know, I was always going out with my friends and, you know, grabbing, grabbing beers and that kind of thing. So coming to Japan uh, was like, you know, just turning off the faucet and, and I had no uh, no social network, and that that you know I didn't think that that would have as big an effect on me as it did, but it it, it got weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It because you're completely out of the element that you're used to, and when it finally hits you, like okay, this is real. I'm this is my life now. This is not just some new place. This is this is everything becomes normal. Then you're just like oh. Yeah. I haven't been making any friends or I haven't been doing this and this and this and so it sort of all just goes, just like hit you yeah. and you're just like fuck you know um, how- I remember asking myself yeah. a lot of times like am I doing the right thing like am I you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. am I making a mistake like uh, but also at the time you know um, I did have that thing where I asked myself if I should be leaving Japan and moving on at the end of this like seven months you know and like I said at the time I had like I had just met uh, just met this you know awesome awesome woman had this you know girlfriend going on and you know and uh, and I I was asking myself like I I wasn't really thinking about coming home to America because keep in mind this is also November of 2016 and Trump had just become president Hmm. and America was losing its mind yeah everybody was like at each other's throats and I was like I don't want to go back to America at all right now but uh, but yeah I did ask myself if I was doing the right thing it, that that had crossed my mind yeah yeah uh, so how long did you go through this sort of uh, slump I guess until you kind of rebounded out out of, out of that and then you, and uh, you usually that phase after the negative dip is sort of a uh, yeah this is this is where I'm at but you gotta. I mean, you, you see the good and the bad, and you just you you choose to stay because the good outweighs the bad. And I mean, that, at least that's that's what I went through. Uh, did did it turn out that way for you? Yeah, I think um, like my that that slump, that kind of weird lonely phase was. It lasted about about two months. Yeah. And uh, uh, I know. Yeah, when I came out of it, I had um, I had connected with a couple of guys that were also English teachers. And kind of fell into a regular thing where every Thursday night they, you know, went out for beers, and uh, and so that like made all the difference. Was having that like that Thursday night, I looked forward to it, and it was great, and uh, kind of uh, opened me opened me back up to kind of feeling more normal. Right. And uh, but I think that's part of why, like I said, my honeymoon period lasted about nine months, it was because there was. A few months of weird time hmm. where it was by myself and I really wasn't getting out and uh, so when I got out of that slump and I kind of made some friends and got out into you know the izakayas and had beers and, you know just being more social then that kind of gave way to a good set of months where like the whole world changed it became much more happy I had guys showing me around you know, uh, this is a good place to eat, this is a good place to eat, have you ever tried this, I haven't tried that, because I did show up without a whole lot of knowledge about what to look for or find, so. Right, right, right. So, um, you, you now have been in Japan two and a half years, what does, uh, do do you plan, uh, you you still have the same job that you did uh, with the Board of Education, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I'm still, uh, still working for them. It's a fun little gig. 
like yeah, it. Yeah. So do you have any plans to change that? Or like, is there something that you want to do while still living here that's different than English teaching? Or are you happy with what you're doing for the time being? I think um, I'm, I'm happy with what I'm doing. Um, I do sometimes ask myself if I'm, if I'm treading water. I do ask myself if, you know, if I should be expanding myself. I'm starting to wonder if this is like a, you know, like a, um, a theme with me. You know, it's like a, it's the same feeling I had when I was working for the security company. Right. So, um, so I do ask myself if that's uh, something going through my head that's the uh, same thing as, as that. Um, I know that, I know that uh, when I was, <laughs> sorry, I have a friend giving me the middle finger. Um, uh, but I, I do. <laughs> Sorry, I do know that uh, that working for Board of Education is really fun. It's really really good right now, and I know that um, maybe in the future. I mean, I have a lot of my friends that do toss around the idea of like, hey, have you thought about like opening up a school or something? Because um, some people are doing that, right. and uh, there's some money to be made, and uh, and I I do kind of admire and envy that entrepreneur entrepreneurial can speak entrepreneurial spirit um, but I, I don't also don't know that like that I that I have that much energy in myself to start like a school man that's a lot of work it is a lot of work um, I, I was at that same position you're at now uh, a few years ago and just through you know I, I I'm, I'm I'm not a really big believer in like supernatural type things but you ever hear of um, people who just like they, they they have this dream or this goal and it's so strong that somehow it attracts that sort of situation to them you know like um, the secret or, or some of those bullshit books like that like I don't I don't and I still don't believe in that but the more that I focus myself in that direction like opportunities just started coming up and and that's how I got involved with what I'm, what I'm doing now and uh, it was it was just because I had had that mindset there you know um, uh, but it, you're right it, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of work it's a lot of extra work it's not just the teaching you know you, there's so many different aspects to to running stuff that you don't think about in the beginning but you know, and every day is just sort of a new, new thing. You know, like if you're at a job, the first year is always new. Everything's mm-hmm. kind of new. But once you start your second year there and you do the same thing, you're kind of like, okay, I kind of understand what I'm doing now and, and things are a little bit easier. When you're growing a company, mm-hmm. every day is new and the next year, everything is still new so it's like you're always in that not sure what you're going to do next but you got to figure it out fast phase and yeah. it's stressful but at the same time it's a bit exciting because it's never boring if that makes any sense yeah yeah, yeah totally yeah and that's one of the things in japan that i didn't really have a whole lot of exposure to back home yeah. is um is like when you when you meet like entrepreneurs, like I've I've met quite a few entrepreneurs here in here in uh, in in Japan. You know, guys running businesses, starting businesses, and that kind of thing. Um, and so that's kind of uh, really opened my eyes to how much work that takes and how hard those people work. And I I didn't have an appreciation for that as much as I gained when I came here and uh, and it, it takes a lot of work man you know definitely because you know I, I've always had kind of a you know like oh the boss is a dick and you know the boss doesn't give you know shit about us and you know and uh, you know look look at what we're doing and we, we get to walk away with only only 15 bucks an hour and you know and flipping out but I'll tell you dude starting a business and running a business that takes a lot of work and it's a 24-hour operation I definitely learned to appreciate the entrepreneur after this once you're on the other side, you completely, you think back to what you used to think, and you're just like, 
shut the fuck up. You know, you don't know, like, you yeah, know, we get to have hobbies. You know, those people don't like yeah. work as their hobby a lot of the times. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's not it's not all bad. I mean, it's 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 yeah. a lot of fun. But you know, you just gotta you gotta know what you're getting yourself into. It's uh, to 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 grow in any way past just being a human tape recorder, so to speak. Yeah. In an English job, you gotta take on responsibilities that you may not even think that you're capable of doing, but you gotta see if you can do it or not. You know, and and it's it's both stressful and exciting at the same time. So um, if you're if, if you know that going in though, you kind of expect it, and it's not as not as bad as you'd think. So. No, I mm-hmm. mean, if you have an idea, go for it because um, Japan is is pretty for for just like a normal entrepreneurial endeavor. It's it, it, they don't really encourage people to do that too much here. It's sort of like just join a company and just follow that and climb the ladder, you know. But mm-hmm. but you know, being non-Japanese, we we kind of we're already sort of on the outside, so we kind of it's it's a little bit easier for you know if you have like a permanent residency and you can get a bank loan and you know if you have all the things like that needed then it you know you can do it so Mm -hmm. it's just you got to figure out what you want to do got an idea go for it you know so yeah totally yeah so you had mentioned before Mm -hmm. so coming to japan this wasn't your first time visiting a foreign country correct yeah no no i um i had done a lot of traveling before this um right. you and you mentioned just, something about going to europe at, at some point yeah yeah um so i i had never been to asia before i came here but but i did um take uh, a big backpacking trip uh, two two summers in a row actually i was, I was pretty lucky um to be able to pull it off. But, um, in, uh, 2006, um, I was, you know, was 21 years old, 21, 21 year old James. And, uh, I went backpacking through Europe and, uh, and I had, <clears throat> I had a girlfriend at the time that was, uh, studying abroad in Greece and she was just doing like a six month, six month program. And, she was uh, studying abroad in in Athens, in in the major city there, and and so uh, wanted to go visit her. I wanted to kind of experience traveling. Before that, I had only ever been to like Canada, and I'm from Seattle, so that's no big, you know, it's just down the street. But um, so, so going to Mexico for a Texan, yeah, it's just it's just there, yeah. you know, just there. Yeah. yeah, it's right across the mountain. Yeah, it's like, and so like. Um, so uh, I booked a booked a trip to go out and and uh, visit this uh, girlfriend, and I uh, flew into uh, Athens to go go visit her and uh, see Greece, and that was a mind blower. You know, like when walking around in in Athens, um, you know, seeing these like buildings that are just you know outrageously old, like. You know, just ancient civilization. You know, you know, next to a McDonald's, like everything is. Right. And uh, Japan sort was, of has that sort of feel to it too. You know. Oh, totally. Yeah, that's that's you know that's one of the one of the, like I said is one of the things that that uh, I loved about the idea of Japan before I came too, was uh, seeing that that old stuff. You know, I went and saw like the, you know, the Acropolis and you know that. Uh, uh, what is it? The uh, Temple of Apollo is just at the bottom of the hill, and um, I remember that that was a, a fantastic uh, trip. Uh, kind of went, kind of went around, you know, around Europe to a, a lot of different countries, but started started in Greece, and Greece was kind of home base when I went. Yeah, so um, like, uh, let's see, let's see, I started in Greece, took a plane, I flew to. See, I flew to Germany for a quick layover, went to go visit a friend of mine, my friend Dave in Copenhagen, and he showed me around in Copenhagen and 
Denmark and and then uh, went to Sweden just kind of say I was there I took the train over to Malmo and then hopped on another train down through Amsterdam stayed there for a couple of days went to and Amsterdam was a trip that's mm. uh, you know, the, oh, it was so, yes. it was so literally uh, and figured uh, but um, but uh, yeah I could well, I could go talking for a while on what happened in Amsterdam but uh, and then you know and then to Paris and then down through Switzerland and, and uh, in Italy and, and came back but uh, but yeah I'd been been through Europe went there to visit uh, visit a girlfriend who was studying abroad and uh, there's actually there's a pretty good story there on that girlfriend I'm avoiding saying right now but uh but yeah but uh when i went to go visit that girlfriend uh three days into being there uh you know before i go in there i'd seen like the facebook was pretty new at the time yeah and uh and i remember that there was a well, bunch of these kind of the oh, yeah. fact that you call it the facebook that just yeah. shows the time that you went there that's yeah. what people called it it was the facebook so the face- yeah 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 on facebook yeah so there was a uh, there was these these moments where, like you know, she was, you know, doing that kind of uh, you know travel brag where she's like posting pictures on on Facebook and everything, and and uh, yeah, this is before Instagram and everything, right? So oh yeah, uh, Facebook yeah. was was like there was MySpace, but like MySpace was for like kids who complained about stuff and really liked listening to screen music and like emo music and and shit, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> Not I wasn't involved in those crowds, but like, uh, but like that's kind of what it was. I had a MySpace page, but um, MySpace but, represent, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so like these pictures were coming out on Facebook of like her with the, with her friends getting drunk, you know, and then her like standing next to such and such, you know, you know, temple of whatnot, and you know, and uh, and then there was quite a few pictures of her like next to this one guy like over and over again and there were a couple of pictures where like this guy was like sitting on her lap or like she was sitting on his lap or they're being drunk and like you know kind of rolling around just from what the photos looked like and uh and uh so i don't know what to tell you though man i mean uh it looks awfully suspicious but oh well indeed and uh and that was kind of you know i kind of but me being non-confrontational James I I uh, was just like okay I'm going to go to I'm going to go to Greece and girlfriend and I are going to have a good time and I'm not going to bring it up and uh <laughs> and uh it turns out I didn't need to cuz uh 3 days into being there she broke up with me and I had bought a plane ticket and like fuck dude yeah I planned out a whole whole like 3 weeks and uh yeah, basically, I was there for three days. She uh, she split up with me when I got there, and I remember being just like, you know, oh, you know, you know, woe is me, just like everything sucks. And uh, sounds like a bitch. Oh, <laughs> yeah, in the in the the purest form of the definition, man. She was like, she was not she was not a cool person to kind of let me go through all those motions to drop that on me when I got there. Well, but fuck, I mean, you bought. She knew that you had planned to be come there like th- for three weeks to visit her. Yeah, and then she breaks up with you like three days in. It's like, oh fuck, man. That, yeah, yeah. But what what did you what did you do after that then? Because because this actually, it yeah, turns out, it turns out better, doesn't it? Yeah, it does turn out better. Um, because, um, like there was this weird kind of like. I don't know, kind of the words that comes to mind. Um, there was kind of the pathetic day where, like, it was yeah. right afterwards where I, I didn't quite know what to do. And it's like, okay, I'm in Greece and uh, my game plan has just changed. And, uh, and like, oh, and it was the worst. We were going out to, like, lunch with her friends and her friends all knew it was up. And I was just this, like, guy that was there that's her ex boy and everyone knew that she was like with this other guy but nobody was like everybody was you could tell everybody was kind of like pretending and it was just the worst and uh it finally like 
kind of chipped away at me enough to where I was just like, you I got to the fuck out of there. <laughs> I was just like, fuck this. And yeah. so I grabbed my backpack and I was just like, I'm going to see you later. And uh, so, so I grabbed my backpack and I had bought a Eurail pass. And I went down to the train station and I just remember looking around you know, different places I could go. And I'm like, okay, I want to go up into, um, like, I want to go up into Italy. I've never been to Italy before. And, uh, so I hopped on train, went to, um, you know, I can't even remember the name of the town, but it's like you cross over into the Peloponnese and you go further West and then you are at this big port and you cross a boat that goes to, uh, Bari. Bari in Italy. I want to say the name of the city was like Patria or Patra or something like that, but it was like, um, but anyhow, I, I hopped this, this boat over to Italy and, uh, I met these like fellow travelers and that was the first time that I'd ever like met fellow travelers. And, uh, and these people were outrageously fun and, it was funny because you'll you'll meet people on the road, uh, what, <clears throat> like people you're not looking for, you know. They're just they kind of cross your path, and maybe you're from America too or whatever, and you start talking about America, or you know somebody sees your, you know your, uh, you know Seahawks hat or whatever, and you know gets to talking to you. Oh, I'm a you know I'm a Dallas fan. Oh, cool man. Like a, you know, oh no hard feelings. Yeah, cool man. Well, uh, you know where are you going? And you get to kind of talking about it, and maybe you're kind of heading to the same place, but like these guys, we were all in this overnight boat and we had nothing to do. And, uh, and so we had bought these kind of general tickets that were like for the deck. And, um, so, you know, we kind of got up to the deck and kind of, you know, claimed our spots and everything like that. And we kind of set up camp all next to each other. And, and, uh, and I had bought like a bottle of Uzo cause I have a, particular affinity for ouzo. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but it's kind of like a licorice flavored Greek national drink and and uh <laughs> to your face you're making. Um, uh, just the, no, the term licorice flavored yeah, just yeah, like, sets, it, yeah, that doesn't sound good at all. Yeah, it cuts one or two ways. Either you like black licorice or you don't. Yeah. And uh but um but yeah, so I had this like bottle of ouzo and they were all kind of like we were like we had like bottles of wine and stuff that we had in our bags and and then we bought some beers from like somewhere in the somewhere in the ship that was like selling beer and then we all kind of did this like powwow where we kind of put everything down and we just kind of all got drunk and played cards and uh hung out and it was fantastic and uh you know and this was like when like no one was on Facebook or the Facebook. Uh, no one was on the Facebook, Facebook as much. Yeah. So, so we were all exchanging like email addresses written on the back of like receipts with like your travel pencil. And, uh, and so we were like writing this stuff down and kind of exchanging each other's information, you know, in case, you know, whatever, like we might run into each other later or want to. And, uh, and then <clears throat> I'm getting off the, I remember getting off the boat and, uh, you know, talking to these, these two Australian guys and, uh, they were like, <clears throat> cause I had told them the whole story. They're like, you know, oh, so what are you doing traveling around? And I was like, oh, I came to visit my, you know, my girlfriend. She broke up with me. And they're like, you know, these guys are like, oh, your girlfriend broke up with, oh, that's fucked up. And <laughs> like, oh, let's get pissed. It's actually, and, it's actually well, yeah, <laughs> that was, that was pretty decent Australian accent there. Ah, oh, thanks. So, but uh, but they were like, Not you know, I could judge, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, uh, you know, like, what are you doing? And you know, after this, and I was like, I want to, I want to go see like uh, Italy and stuff. I don't really have a plan. And they're like, ah, oh, fuck it, come with us. Um, they're like, we're gonna go uh, camping up in, up in Switzerland. We got this like campground. Um, you know, if you're not up to anything, like, come with us. And I was like, sure. And so, tagged along with these guys and you know, bought some train tickets with them and, and, uh, you know, just drank beers all the way through Italy, went up into Switzerland and camped, had a great time. And then I made the mistake of going to an internet cafe. Hmm. And, uh, that's when I discovered like 
girlfriend had like written me a letter or, you know, like a little message. And she was like, she was like, I think I've made a big mistake and we just really need to talk. And of course this was like before you could really Skype someone, you know, like on the go. Like I didn't have a laptop and the computers were all, you know, like this was kind of for that pre pre smartphone. So yeah. Yeah. It was pre smartphone. I had a, you know, I had a phone that I had turned off. that was like a Nokia brick and uh, I had in my backpack, you know, waiting for when I got back to America. But anyhow, like, so she wanted me to come home and I was like, I'll not home, but to Athens. And I was like, I'll think about it. And then she like messaged me like, Oh, I made a big mistake. Please come back. We need to talk. And so, like, uh, you know, had another camping night with these guys. And they're like, Are you serious about this girl? And I was like, no, nah, I don't know, man. She's pretty cool, but whatever. And like, oh, we're going to go into Germany and stuff. And I was like, uh, okay, well, I'm going to double back. Me being stupid and young and, you know, made the decision. I'm going to go back and try and work this out. Maybe it's, I don't know. And, you know, looking back on it, it's like the worst. You know, like, she's cheating on you. Like, don't do this. Um, but like, uh, so I turned back around in Switzerland, went back down to Greece, went and, you know, got in touch with her. And then she kind of, you know, lets the cat out of the bag that was kind of already out of the bag, like kind of, you know, and then I had this moment that was kind of the same thing, only it was twice as powerful where I was like, Oh no, for real, fuck all this. Yeah. And uh, that's when I went down to the train station again, busted out the map, looked at the map, and I was like, where's somewhere weird that I've never been to before? Um, okay. Um, I saw that there was a train leaving in a couple of hours for uh, he headed for Istanbul from Athens. And I didn't know shit about Istanbul, but one of the guys had that I was that I met in Italy was like oh you need to go it's a cool place just came from there you know it's like it's like this kind of Middle Eastern country but it's also like European it's it's kind of a cool mix go check it out so I had that in my head and uh, so bought the ticket sat at a cafe stared at my ticket drank my beer and waited for the train to come got on the train you know on the way over um, went to a, another like a little border crossing city called Pythion hmm. uh, and I you know that little station crosses my mind all the time I kind of wonder if it still looks the same I'd, I'd like to go back there but it was just this little uh, train station in the middle of like nowhere uh, right outside the border and it had a little little like corner store and went in there and like bought a pack of cigarettes and and a thing of like water and a little thing of wine and these like little cookies and that was lunch. I I didn't pack anything. That was just lunch. I got it at the store. And uh, but like hanging out, um, I did meet this these two guys, um, German guys. Name is Philip and a Czech guy named Radic and. Uh, Similar kind of thing, just getting out to talking, and they're, you know, what brings you traveling? Same thing, told him the story. It's like, yeah, I came here for meeting my, you know, girlfriend, and she broke up with me, and they were like, you know, fuck that. Like, you know, come, come with us. And uh, I was like, cool. And, uh, and, you know, so we got to Istanbul, and they're like, where are you staying? And I'm like, I don't have a place. And they're like, oh, okay, for real, come with us. Like, and went to a place called Cordial House in Istanbul and stayed at this little hostel. And it was great, great little hostel. They had little cubbies with, you know, lockers that I could stuff my, my bag into and, you know, leave it alone and, and stuff. And we mobbed around Istanbul together and, uh, and got to see a lot, of, a lot of things I never thought I'd see. Um, some really cool stuff. And then got... You know, they were like, let's cross the river, go over to a place called, oh, I, forgot, I can't even remember, but it's on the, it's on the, uh, it's on the east side of the Bosphorus River. It's the Asian side of, of, uh, of Istanbul. Right. So when you cross over, you're actually like, you're out of Europe officially. And uh, so on the boat, like we met this guy named Mustafa and uh, still friends with him, actually. Um, 
still talk to them, uh, which is bizarre. But, uh, you know, just because, like, you can make friends sometimes and, you know, still talk to them and wish them, you know, wish them happy holidays, that kind of thing, you know. Right. Uh, but, like, uh, so um, met this guy, and this guy, Mustafa, was like, what are you guys up to tonight? And like, nothing. And, you know, then proceeded to, like, show us around to a couple of different restaurants. We, you know, hopped in a cab and, and, uh, and then the next day he was, you know, or he told us before, he's like, next day, um, he's like, if you want, I have the day off, call this number and, um, we can meet up and, uh, maybe hang out again. And we did, we totally did. Night ended. Uh, next day I called him up. He came and met us at like this little weird coffee stand that's outside of the, uh, blue mosque. And, and uh, he was just like, let's go to this restaurant and go around and totally, totally showed us around. And that is one thing is I am so blown away by the, the kindness of strangers. Yeah, yeah. Um, like totally blown away by it. And, uh, and like, um, you know, after he showed us around, I parted ways with the guys and went back to Greece and, um, you know, flew – flew home and uh yeah and i remember that you know me going through northern europe and everything like that was a different part of that whole thing but like um but like that little stretch where like my girlfriend broke up with me and then like you know there's there are blessings in disguise yeah. and that was, that was one of them cuz like yeah it's a really shitty story and and tell people you know about that and they kind of cringe when you're telling it to them but it's like you know hold up no things can really get better like you you know like you you just if you just take you know take the universe back in your own hands yeah and, well i mean it sounds like the the shit that you were dealt with on that trip you made the fucking best of it you you seem like you had one of the coolest trips of your life you know yeah just, totally you went all around europe yeah because yeah, some bitch didn't know how to make up her mind, you know. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, totally. That's one of those unexpected things. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, then the, that's when, like, like I said, I did it two summers in a row. You know, the next summer I ended up studying abroad in Turkey and then going around Europe again. That's, and that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, that's, how, that's how that all goes down. But uh, again, reconnected with that guy Mustafa the second summer in a row. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, if you if you could give any like advice to people who have they haven't traveled abroad or they're they're thinking about it, what what would you uh, what would you say to them? Um. There are a million um, excuses that we give ourselves as to why we can't why we can't do it. Yeah. Um, I, I still do it. I still do it. Like you, when it comes to, you know, buying a ticket and going to like Thailand, you know, or something, I still do it. I, you know, I, I think to myself like, oh, I don't, I don't have the money. Um, I don't have the money. But uh, you would, you would be surprised how little it actually costs to, right. uh, to actually make it work. You, you really just have to prioritize it. I put it in the same, same category as to why. You know, why I'm not working out regularly. You know, it's like, uh, why am I not working out every day? Well, you know, I could tell myself, like, I just don't have enough time. I'm tired when I get off of work. But clearly what it is is that I've not prioritized it. Right. It's just not something that's that's on the top of my list. I've I've got drinking beers and watching TV and in, in my underwear. <laughs> yeah. Highly prioritized above. Yeah. But <laughs> That's all well and good. But, you know, you do yeah. that seven days a week and you kind of like, okay what the fuck am I doing? You know, I got to do something else in this. So, yeah. And, and it's, it's not as expensive as people, um, make it, make it out to be. Um, I think the biggest hurdle, um, and this is, this is echoed definitely in that book, Vagabonding by Rolf Potts. Um, if, if you have the money, uh, to buy a ticket and you can buy a ticket for yourself like six months in advance, and you have vacation time, and it's totally, if it's possible, you know, like time-wise, no, no big advance, events or anything coming up. Um, 
do the thing when, you know, maybe you get like a couple beers in here or whatever. Go out on, you know, go out on Kayak or Expedia or whatever. Look up those ticket prices. And if you've got the money, buy the ticket. Yep. And then once that ticket's bought, you'll feel a feeling of relief yep. and, and release of that, that tension. And you will mentally flip and you will start planning for that vacation. Yep. And you won't buy, you won't, you won't go out to eat when you could make the sandwich at home. Yeah. You won't um, you won't go see the movie when you can rent one. It's all those little steps along the way. And once you buy that ticket, that's when it really changes. So like do yourself that favor and just buy that ticket and have faith in your ability to um, to to make it work. Cuz cuz it it uh, it is it is really not that hard once you start that process. Once you get a month in you'll be asking yourself why you didn't buy the ticket sooner. Yeah, yeah. All together. For sure, for sure, man. All right, James. Um, great. It was great having you on. Uh, thank you so much. Your your stories were awesome, and you it was actually really helpful. You're the first person I've talked to that actually kind of went through step by – not step by step, but just kind of what the experience of just coming to Japan and, and getting like a basic uh, English teaching job is like. And the European story was awesome too. So, um, oh, and and that that's awesome advice. And uh, I I second the book uh, Vagabonding by Rolf Potts. That's an awesome book. Um, that's it's been a big influence on me as well. Uh, so, is there any place that you'd like people to find you if if they want to find you out and get in contact with you? Um, yeah, yeah. You can find me on uh, you can find me on Twitter. Twitter's pretty easy. It's just uh, it's at Carpe Jimbo. So C A R P E J I M B O at okay. Carpe Jimbo. Uh, my screen name on there is Bronson. So uh, hit me up if you have any questions. Um, I'll definitely give you any advice I can offer. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, man. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, you're welcome back anytime. All right. Thanks, man. Cool. Glad to be on. All right. Thanks.